So now on our video on ramming tanks, we have here Jens Wiener from the Militärhistorie Museum Dresden, and he was a conscript in the 1990s, right? Mm -hmm. And you were a Leopard 1 driver. Yeah. So do you have any instructions or prohibitions or something about ramming tanks? Was this mentioned? No, I had nothing to do with this. So it, it was it never didn't mentioned. Came up. It was never mentioned. And I remember there was one occasion in the wood <laughs> where we met an uh, enemy Le Leopard 2. And the distance was only 10 meters. And both couldn't shoot at each other because the lasers blockaded in distances under 10 meters. Because this really happened, I don't know, maybe one time in a million or so. But it happened and it was only 10 meters. And the Leopard 2, they drove back and I followed them. And I was getting faster <laughs> and so the distance was not... Uh, 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 widening and and then my commander told me stop you won't run them <laughs> uh, you will run them if you drive like this stop and so we broke it off and because ramming is not really an option okay but let, let's assume this situation mm. would have happened you would be coming from the side mm. and it would be real combat and it mm. would be an enemy tank mm. would you consider ramming it could this be an option Makes for no the sense. commander Makes but, no sense. But you could immob could you immobilize the enemy tank by ramming him? I don't think so. I I because in in a situation situation like this, uh, the difference in speed is not high enough for an effective ram. You know, one is driving back with yeah. let's say thirty kilometers. But if you're coming from the side, like yeah, maybe I. You know, in 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 driving school, we had two leopards two uh, that rammed each other by accident. <laughs> frontal uh, in the night and uh, the eight people in there were badly wounded they had i think they had a yeah because because you have no safety seats yeah. at this time and if you drive let's say 50 kilometers per hour and you just crush into an enemy tank then um uh, the uh, Kinetic energy you have bad wounds yeah. like uh, you know losing teeth and and broken your chest or stuff like this. I don't know. And um, the 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 tank had um, small fine lines in it. I don't know the English word um, Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Small breaks. Basically. Yeah. Small breaks were in the tanks. You know, but the tank was not was of course a little bit in a way disabled because the crew was hurt and um, they, they had the brakes in, in, in their tanks. But I think in, 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 to sum it up, the tank was not a total loss or stuff like this. You know, it, it was more a damage as far as I have seen it. That's very interesting mm. because, because, I mean, I didn't suspect that the, the crew would be... But if, if you have a ram from the side and one tank was, was not moving, probably the, the, the damage to the crew would be very limited, right? Yeah, it depends on the speed, but I think yes, yes, because the acceleration. Yeah, but but I don't know if this would be crucial. You know, I don't know. It depends be because we have an ongoing mm. discussion because we're looking at the Second World mm. War and the ramming mm. of tanks is very often shown in movies and other stuff. Yeah. And we are now looking into the various aspects, and you are one of the few experts actually because we we look mostly at at, at sources and mm -hmm. but we are not tank drivers but you are a tank driver so yeah i think i think it will disable the tank but not destroy it you, yeah. you know let's say it like this this is most most likely the case but i don't know because in in world war 2 i i also read this also because i'm mostly a world war 2 historian and um i have to say i have some doubts about this because the speeds are just not high enough you know, I mean, how fast were a Panzer III, Panzer IV, T-34? I think T it's mostly for immobilizing the tank. Please? I think it's mostly for immobilizing the enemy tank. Yeah, but, but even then I'm asking what happens if you ram a tank with, let's, see, let's say, 10 kilometers per hour? What does this mean? You know, I mean, it's not fast. A, a tank is designed to, to, to stand against armor-piercing projectiles, <laughs> which are really have energy, you know. And I don't know if you have the, the speeds to make it efficient, you know. The thing is, I, re, I know from a Harris army, from an mm -hmm. army regulation mm -hmm. that in 1941 they said, don't ram tanks. Mm -hmm. But in, in the manual for the Sturmgeschützschule from 1943, mm -hmm. I think from October, mm -hmm. it especially is mentioned 
that it's allowed and you can do it, or it's even recommended. I don't know. It's in my Stuck School video. And this is the interesting part where mm -hmm. we got thinking. So if they change the opinion from 1941 to 1943, why did this happen? And if they change it that late in the war, there must be some merit to it, because else they wouldn't put it in the Sturmgeschichtsschule recommendations. Mm -hmm. That's the interesting can't, can't, I don't have an explanation for this, but I'm just asking how fast is a Sturmgeschütz in the terrain? 20 That's kilometers good. per hour? I don't know. Let's say 30 at most. And, and, and the enemy tank, maybe it's, uh, it's also driving a little bit in an angle which is not perfect. Yeah. So I don't know. I think it's mostly for immobilizing the tank in, in the, under conditions where everything else is more dangerous. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, I mean, ramming a Sturmgeschütz in enemy makes sense because then it can turn its gun on it. So you, and, mm. and the other way is you, you, if you make it immobilized, you make it even aware for other uh, um, tanks. Mm. And Roman Töppel noted to me that at some points Panzergrenadier mm. used the half tracks to ram enemy tanks mm. and then they got out their, their um, mm. magnetic mm. mines mm. and then destroyed the tank. Mm. In this case, it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Because, well, if you're in a half track, you can't destroy a tank and then ram it, mm. and then you get out your infantry. So, but ramming it, but, but then again, I need to read up exactly what was written in the Sturmgeschütz manual. Yeah, maybe I, my assumption would be maybe it's only because of the combat spirit, which is not to underestimate in a crucial situation that you say, that you give the mentality to say it's better to ram than yeah. to withdraw. I mean, it's basically similar to the situation you ran in mm. because mm. both couldn't fire. Yeah. And then one commander would probably say, okay, let's ram mm. him. And this would give you the, let's say, the moral superiority mm. on the yeah. battlefield and give you back the initiative. Yeah, in, I, like, in I, like, I like this interpretation because in this case I had it. But uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I, I don't know. I, 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 I'm not sure because the speeds have to be a little bit high, you know, to make, to make sense for ramming. And if you have a difference from only 10 kilometers per hour, I, I can't imagine that there would be any hard damage on a tank also. You know? I, I mean, the, the thing is here, the, the, mm. the psychological effect, mm. I think, is, is crucial in that sense because it's likely not expected to get even rammed mm -hmm. even with that low speed. And that just mm -hmm. will put you off a few seconds that might yeah. give you the edge yeah. in combat. Yeah, yeah. So and, that, and, and maybe it's also, if it, if it comes to the Sturmgeschütz, maybe it's, as you say, the enemy is not able to fire on you. And maybe that's already enough. It's not so yeah. much about disabling the enemy by, by damage, but disabling him by surprise, by mentality, by, by, I mean, I mean, I think we have, we have some sources from World War II where Russians tried to ram or they ram. And, and I think the Germans were also always a little bit impressed of this, you know, about the combat spirit they had. Yeah. It's also the same with the Air Force. Yeah. The, the Russians, The Russian pilots tried to ram the enemy if if there were, was no other options left, and I think this has a lot to do with combat spirit and mentality and so on. Uh, also, think about the Japanese. You know, it was their last weapon um, in, in World War II, if you wanted to say it like this. And I would interpret it a little bit more like this. You know, to to say to to say as the Germans said at this time, run an den Feind. Yeah, yeah. to to to. <laughs> to overthrow him, to surprise yeah. him, to let him know second left to react to anything. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, well, okay. thank you very much. Yeah, no, my pleasure. Thank you for watching and see you next time. Well, hello everyone. We have Chifton here. Hello again. Ah, say, it's a shame we can't be in front of the flag tower again. I, I seem to be stuck here. Yeah, we are, we are it was quite a travel. We went from the Wild East now to the Wild West in Texas. So, Chifton, you saw the interview with Jens. What are your thoughts or additional comments on, on his elaborations? Well, from the, the beginning start point where he says we were never trained on this, this is the same in the US. I mean, I've, I have a $3 million dollar tank I, and I am trained to put rounds into targets. Running over things, there are exceptions. So, for example, troops, you can run over people. You can run over cars and trucks and whatever if you really want to. And I'm going to guess you can run over something like a, a BMP, although I don't know how much damage that's actually going to do to it, unless, of course, you run over the gun. 
Uh, but in terms of a doctrinal thing of what you can run over in your tank, the only instructions that we ever got that were clear was how thick a tree you could barge over. I mean, if the tree is too yeah. thick, then you're just going to cause trouble for you for the crew. Not the tank probably won't care, but the crew certainly. Yeah, won't. it's just funny because I recently read it in German regulations from the 30s and, and 40s about what tree size you can run over with a pencil tube. <laughs> Well, there you go. It hasn't, it hasn't changed in concept. I'm going to assume that the Panzer II was a much smaller tree than the M1 Abrams. So, but 20 centimeters. I, I, I would need to look up. The, it's, it's been a while. I remember being taught. I'm, I'm thinking maybe two feet, but... Oh, that's, so, that's six, about 60 centimeters. Centimeter, yeah. yeah. Well, again, you're talking about 70 tons and the front of the tank is pointy. Yeah. Uh, so the trick with it, though, is you want to make sure you knock over the tree, not slice the tree. Because if you slice the tree, then you have a, you know, a stump of tree about yay high that your tank will run over and then you'll end up getting center high. Oh, yeah, that's bad. And then you have to reverse off. But if you go slowly, then you will knock the tree over. Uh, so it's the thickness of the tree isn't necessarily for the bending of the tree, bending and snapping. But to make sure that you can you can actually knock over the you know the uproot the whole damn tree, and if it's thinner than that amount, even if you don't bend it uh, or uproot it, then it should bend enough under the seventy ton weight of the tank that you're not going to get center high either way. That's a theory. It, it, it's like this whole thing. Oh, well, I want I want to run through buildings in my tank. Well, no, there's a very damn good reason why tankers don't go through buildings. It's not because of all the rubble that falls on top. You close the hatch, you're fine. The question is, did the building have a basement? Ah, yes. You don't want to fall in. Yeah. No, that would be a bad thing in a tank. <laughs> and of course, there's no way. There's almost no way. I mean, maybe if you've got the little windows, you can say, aha, that one's got a basement. And also the barrel is probably a problem as well. Well, the barrel is less of a problem because you spin it, you spin oh, yeah. it over the, the back deck. I mean, it's the same when you're going through mines. You, you go clearing mines, your gun tube is spun off to the left-hand side so that if the mines detonate, the gun tube is safe. Ah, interesting. And the reason you spin it to the left is that usually if the commander is on the right, it brings the commander further forward so he can see, he can see better what's happening. But, of course, it also means that you no longer have the frontal armor to the enemy and everybody's going to hammer at you. So, yeah, that's, anyway, slightly off topic. But uh, anyway, so going back, I agree with Jens that there was no official training in the modern U.S. Army that I'm aware of that says run over other armored vehicles or run into other armored vehicles. Uh, the situation where he ran into, at 10 meters, the other leopard, and nobody could shoot. Well, that was the technical limitation of the laser. Yeah. In reality, I'm going to shoot. <laughs> I mean, there's no reason not to. Um, outside of that, maybe in extreme desperation, I mean, obviously there have been instances where it has happened, where for, again, there, there's something going on that means that you can't leave, you're out of ammo, and you know, that if you lose this, then you're host, and so there's nothing for it but to try to run, uh, ram the enemy, and the, the only times I can think of that happening was in uh, was in the Second World War, occasionally, particularly on the on the Eastern Front. Uh, but again, that would not have ever been the first choice of action. I mean, think about it. If you're charging into somebody doing 30, let's say 30 kilometers an hour, and you have to cross 800 meters, how long is it going to take you to get across that 800 meters in the hope that just because you have no ammunition, the other guy also doesn't have any ammunition. Yeah. So, so that, that it's, it's quite a ballsy move. So what do you think about Jens' um, assumption that it can only, or that probably main use would be like in a situation like both tanks meet each other at very close range and to regain initiative. So basically to have this aggressive spirit like Basically, both are like, okay, what we do now, like they had in the training situation, that then one guy say, okay, we ram him, so that basically to overcome the, well, not it bad comes luck. Back to, it, comes, it comes back to the same question. So, A, how quickly does it take to turn the turret versus closing the distance of 10 meters? 
So turn for a No, no, you're already in that situation, basically. You are at 10 meters just in front of each other because that happened in the training situation. Okay. So you're, you're just like... Yeah, yeah but they said they of... couldn't shoot, not because they weren't ready, but they couldn't shoot because of just the, laser. the lasers didn't yeah. work. Uh, but, or okay, let's assume, is... assume both don't have ammunition or both have a jam. That would be, for me, the only reasonable explanation why you do it nowadays, that basically you gain the initiative back, whoever basically acts first in an aggressive manner that, that you overwhelm the enemy. And then you get out and you shoot at each other with pistols? <laughs> I haven't thought that. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, what, what happens next? Uh, okay, the, these heat of the, heat of the moment decisions probably don't necessarily take into account the question of what the hell do we do next? But uh, I, I, I see where you're going. I'm not going to say it could never happen because over the, over the entire course of human history, there might perhaps, by the time the tank becomes obsolete, be such an event that it happens. Okay, you're an officer, you're an armed officer. So basically, let, let's assume this situation happens. You come across another tank. He can't shoot. You don't really know. And... and you definitely know you can't shoot. What do you do? Pop smoke. Three, tank to my front, traverse right, engage. Again, you mean you command the other units in... Okay, you are alone. Both are alone. Which is usually well, not what I happens. How up that I'm now alone, facing another tank alone? <laughs> Okay, let's assume there's nobody else out there. Why haven't I run into the rear at this point if all my the rest of my company have been okay, blown Okay, you would pop smoke and retreat, basically. <laughs> yes, because I shouldn't be alone. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. I mean, when I watched the, the other video which we talk about with, with Syria, uh, basically in 1930, 1940, the Germans wrote, you never use a tank alone, point. <laughs> I, I think that rather makes a point for me, then. Okay, if you if you wouldn't have smoke, driver reverse. Still okay. There, there's got to be some cover or concealment somewhere. Um, I if as long as my front is to the enemy, I'm safer. So let's say I chase after this guy and he starts maneuvering, whatever. If I'm trying to chase him, no matter which way he's going, I may leave my flank open to one of his friends. Okay, let's 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 take the exact example. You're in a leopard one, and you are facing a leopard two. You encounter him alone, and he is alone, and you can fire. And I have no smoke grenades. And you have no smoke grenades. And I have no friends. You have no friends. Yeah, alone. <laughs> Do you realize how hypothetical this yeah, is? Yeah, this yeah. Point? The thing is just. Just what would you would you consider it at that point? Because if you if you have said no there, then I can say okay. I guess it would be an option. I mean, <laughs> in the in the ridiculously unlikely hypothetical, I presume I could do it. I mean, it's more along the lines of I'm dead anyway. So what the hell? So in that sense, it, it's basically in, in this situation alone, when you're under a very desperate situation, that you would do it. Yeah, I mean, if, if, it's, if it's doing that and dying, or doing nothing and dying, what the hell? Okay, yeah, that, because that's, that's, uh, that's even a bit stronger than the statement from Jens, I would say, from the assumption, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I remember he mentioned the Kamikazes, if I recall, uh, as another example of desperation. Um, that may be a cultural thing as well. Yeah, but also, I mean, Kamikaze is like you use one plane to damage severely a carrier or a battleship. So there's a, a, a quite significant, let's call it, trade-off. Well, a leopard, tank a leopard versus tank. better than a Leopard 1. Yeah, but, but the thing is, I don't think a tank ramming none of the tanks really gets destroyed completely. No, they don't. Whoever ends up winning the battlefield at the end is going to recover both yeah. vehicles. And they both will be working after a brief repair period. Unless somebody drops a grenade down or something. Yeah. 
Okay, so... Fix bayonets to my pistol. <laughs> so, so you're in, in the Cold War, so basically after World War II, do you know of any incidents or doctrine? I'm not thinking of any. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it happened, maybe in Pakistan or Arab-Israeli wars, some of that could be pretty close quarters, but I not no incidents are coming to mind. Okay. It's then, certainly not taught as an example. Okay, then the, the final point would be a short discussion on, I think the, the one was a Syrian T-72 versus an APC that was, as far as I know, an AC-15, which is a modified version of the American Advanced Fighting Vehicle, which is in itself a modified version of the M113A1, as far as I know. Yeah, that's just the most bizarre video. It's kind of like, what on earth were they thinking? There's two possibilities. One is that these guys in the ACV knew exactly what they were doing. Or the other is that they're going that way, they're going this way. And if you look at the way the trees are, it's entirely possible the trees are fairly spread out. But because because of the way that you know, they intermesh, it's entirely possible that you wouldn't actually see the enemy tank until you're within 50 yards of it. And you would have no idea that they're out there, at which point is a case of, oh, bugger, what the hell do we do now? Um, I can only assume that the ACV's intent was to ram the gun tube of the T-72, big long gun tube, uh, which I don't seem to recall they managed to do. And of course, the T-72 is just trying to get the gun onto the ACV without damaging itself. Um, and then after a little tussle, he buggers off presumably realizing that he was not going to be able to disable the tank and that it was eventually only going to be a matter of time before a 125 millimeter heat round comes into his, uh, into his little APC. So, this so then it's again zigzag through the trees and hope that the dust protects you. So basically this was basically a desperate measure and then also retreat. That's my guess. I, I, again, unless they were incredibly brave and realize, hey, look, there's a tank out here. We might be able to pull this off. I probably wouldn't have done it, but then again, I I don't fight in the Syrian civil war, and I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm part of a very professional military organization, so, and I and I and I know I have support on the other end of the radio. So it, it, it's a fascinating little video, and it's it's humorous as all hell. But I mean, if it was deliberate, balls of steel. If it wasn't deliberate, it was very good, quick thinking on the spur of the moment, followed by a very sensible decision to disengage. I think we covered everything. So thank you very much for joining. No, not at all. Lots of fun. Always good talking to you. And of course, thank you to the Militär Social Museum der Bundeswehr Dresden for inviting me. As always, sources are listed in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.